Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Curious Collective podcast, conversations designed for the conscious community to bring awareness to those holistic approaches that are out there, to tap into the wisdom and knowledge of our guests to heal, transform, and live as your true soulful self. Today, I am blessed to have here with us the beautiful Julie Lewin. Um, welcome from Light Code Lab. I'm going to just pass it straight over to you to introduce yourself. Hello. Hello, and thank you, Katie, for having me. This is so fun to be able to share what my journey has been with you. Um, so I am the co-founder of Light Code Lab with my beautiful daughter, Tash Lewin, and we position ourselves as the mother-daughter duo. And we started that two years ago, or over two years now, uh, beginning of COVID, we started. Um, but before that, I started this journey in 1984 when Tash was a baby and a clairvoyant said to me that I had this uh, two destinies. The first destiny, the one I was on, was that my marriage would fail, I would remarry quickly and that marriage would fail and I would have very few happy moments in my life. I'd be very ill in my 30s and 40s and die at 53. Oh, so that's a half an hour condensed. I know that it sounds intense. I knew the truth of that. And then he put his finger in the air and he said, but you have a nun and a monk standing there with you and you have an alternate destiny. And if you choose that destiny, your marriage will survive you will overcome the illnesses in your 30s and 40s. You will have many happy moments in your life. You will live into your 90s and you'll be of great benefit to the world. And he said, you have a special gift of X-ray vision and you can see inside of people's bodies. Whoa. Yeah. How was that hearing that? I said, how do I do that? He went, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> he said, you'll have to figure that out. But what he did do is he had a, I don't know whether you remember this, you're probably too young because this is 40 years ago, nearly 38 years ago. We had this thing called a gestetna and you typed onto this um, sheet that then got put onto a machine and you, Ronia, you, you went like this and it shot out a copy of what oh, you wow. It was very old school. It was before photocopiers. So he had a, a fool's cap manual that had been gestetnered yeah. and he loaned it to me and he said, you can start here, read this, but I want it back. Like, oh, wow paper anything paper was precious yeah and, um so I read it and I gave it back to him I don't remember anything that I read but what I did decide was that maybe I needed to be a naturopath mm. so I started studying to be a naturopath and I did really well um got A's for my exams but I got pregnant again and I was one of those people that suffered from bad pregnancy mm. I was sick 24 7 so I couldn't do any more study or exams. So I had to shelve that and I never came back to it. Um, so I'd only done like two terms or something. But, you know, after hearing that and I was planning on leaving my husband with Tash and she was seven months old. So I knew the truth of the first one and I was already unwell. So, I mean, I didn't feel like I had much of a choice. Mm. Have a shit life, have a good life. What do you do? Mm. So I decided that I would figure out how to see inside of people's bodies. And I did. What an adventure. It was a huge adventure. Um, so I went and studied psychic development as well, um, and I did it, our group stayed together, five of us. We met every week for two years. So I developed all my clairs. Nobody said one clair will be dominant. I didn't know that. So mm. I just developed all of them. Mm. And um, we did, you know, all the, the different things like 
psychometry and uh, remote viewing and um, we learned to meditate, all, all the different things. And then that group kind of fell apart. So I, I used to lie in bed at night and say, God, if you want me to do this, you've got to show me how. Yeah. So I started seeing movies in my mind and, and I started imagining that I was traveling through somebody's body. And, you know, the, I don't know if you've seen it, there was a movie where a scientist was shrunk down into a submarine and they put him in the submarine in the, through the tear duct of the person and they travelled through the human body. Oh, wow. So I use um, imagine or imagery from movies to yeah. do what I do. And so I started imagining going in the tear duct and travelling through people's bodies. And then I started telling them things that nobody knew. And I thought, well, maybe I am really doing this. Mm. And so that was what built my confidence but I practiced for 10 years like mm. nobody there were there were no teachers there there wasn't anyone who could teach me how to do it I had to figure it out mm. and be a pioneer and experiment and have curiosity like curiosity is the mm. best strength that you can have if you want to live an extraordinary life, live a, a life that is not mundane and boring. Oh, you yes. have to have curiosity. Please rewind that, listeners, and listen to that again. And that's why this podcast is called The Curious Collective because getting curious is what will help to shake you out of that, you know, the mundaneness, exactly what you said. And I'm so glad that you got curious. I also wanted to talk into while you're there before you keep yeah. sharing is a lot of people are telling me lately and I'm hearing a lot lately that sometimes when we're seeking the answers and looking for the answers outside of ourselves you know we're looking in the wrong spot and that the answers are actually already within you and that as you go deeper within and as you cleanse the layers and as you learn more about yourself the answers are actually already there and you already know some of these things absolutely yeah 100 percent and it, it, even that, Katie, of the answers are within is enough to make someone really angry. And they go, but I wouldn't be asking if I didn't, if I knew the answer. And I think that, that people have this perception of what the answers are within you actually means. Mm -hmm. And I think the we have our own internal gps like we have this like the the gps is it guides us on the road right but we have an internal gps so when i say the answer is within you i mean that you have the tools and the resources and the intuition, everyone's born with intuition. It's not a special gift. Everyone has it. Have some people developed it more? Absolutely. Yeah. But I can tell you that takes practice at every single day. It, and anyone has the ability to practice. Mm. And so it's about calling on all of those things and looking at the signs, looking at the signals, looking at what your environment is sharing with you and looking for it's like um in maths at school we got those problems that we had to solve and we had to figure out the solution that's why we were being given those problems is to wire our brain the neural pathways so we could figure out our problems as an adult mm -hmm. in the real world and so we are given clues every single day. Even within oh. our bodies, like feeling within our own oh. bodies. And if you're so disconnected from your own body, you're not even hearing the clues or messages you're getting every single day. That's exactly right. And that's why I created a metaphysical body language that people can use. It's different to Louise Hay. And the reason why I created my metaphysical body language was because of the 
thousands and thousands of people that I've worked with, I observe similar things happening in their bodies and I link that to the emotions that they were going through. And so our body doesn't dysfunction for no reason. Mm. It all starts with your thoughts and then your emotions. And, you know, I don't know if you've seen What the Bleep Do We Know? Did you see that movie? Not yet, no. Oh, my God. It's on YouTube and everyone should watch it. So if you've heard of Masaru Moto taking the photos of the water crystals, that's what that movie is about. It, it introduces that principle. We're 70% water and so our thoughts impact the 70% water that we are. So our thoughts are actually impacting our body. And if we want to know what our thoughts are doing, observe your body, like mm. take notice of what your body's doing. And about 15, 20, I don't know, back in maybe 15 years ago, we were planning to walk the Camino. And so we were in training to do that. And I hyperflex my knee and I tore my meniscus. And that's kind of like a weak area for me. And I didn't have surgery. I don't made a decision never to have surgery again. And that's a whole other story that we can tell another time. But what happens now is if I make a decision or have a thought that not is on my path or on my purpose, my knee swells up oh. and becomes very sore. Yeah. And I go, hmm, that's curious. Why, what decision have I made? What thought have I had that has made that flare up? Mm. I revoke the thought, I change the decision and the knee goes down and I'm fine again, pain free. Oh, isn't that interesting? The body is the messenger. The body is the messenger. It mm. sure is. And, um, you know, if somebody comes to me and they've got hip problems, I'll say to them, oh, just out of, and I love this word, curiosity. <laughs> so are you thinking of moving house, changing career or making changes in your relationship? They look at me and they go, how do you even know that? I said, because of all the thousands of people I've worked with, I know that when there's a hip problem, that that's where the tension goes mm. when you're thinking about those things. And then they'll say, oh, I'm doing all three. And I go, left side of the body, then that's a block from the past. Right side of the body, something's happened in the last two years that we can release. And then you go in and you release that trapped emotion and the body remedies itself. So this is super interesting. I have a beautiful friend who who's had been a dancer all her life, like danced when she was a child, danced through high school, everything. And then got to a point where her hips no longer worked because, you know, putting your leg up beside your head all the time is not always um, conducive. So their career, right, obviously if your hips don't work, you're stressed and, and worried about your career because you, you can't dance anymore. So yeah. how, that, how does that all tie in? So the thing that I would be saying is, so she's feeling like she can't continue with her career because her hips in flaring up or creating problem. But I would dig deeper than that and I would go, where are you feeling dissatisfied with your career? Mm. Yeah? Where are you feeling like you're done? Where are you feeling like you're not going in the direction that you wanted to go in? And if you won't make a decision, your body will make it for you. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Mm. And then if you then make a decision, your body will relax and remedy itself. So then how does that work if, um, you know, say she goes and gets a double hip replacement and gets brand new hips and then, you know, continues on doing? The thing is, though, Katie, if you don't address the emotion, or what's going on underneath in the subconscious, yeah. 
then she will recreate that scenario. It's not going to be like tomorrow, but if you go and have that done. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody has to have a hip replacement, don't do it. It's all in your head. I'm not saying that. Yeah. What happens is if if we can educate people to manage their thoughts and emotions at a younger age, what like right from children, yeah. then the the deterioration doesn't happen. Yeah. Um and I know that we can reverse degenerative disease because I had thyroid cancer, had my thyroid out in 2000, and they said, look, we know historically that when you have your thyroid out that you're going to get osteoporosis. Mm. That's a historical... I've heard that link. ...based mm. thing. So I started having bone density tests that year and I have them every two years and they were watching my bone density decrease, decrease. And my doctor wanted me to take the drug. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. She slapped her hand on the desk and she said, well, you have to do the exercise. I said, I'll do the exercise. And she said, no, Julie, you actually have to do it. And I said, I will do it. So I did. I did four hours of clinical Pilates a week and six hours of walking. Mm -hmm. And I reversed osteoporosis or osteopenia so my bones were good again and then we moved out here and uh, you know I didn't feel like walking and so I didn't do what I should have been doing so I went back into osteopenia and then a few years back they said you've gone into osteoporosis now you can have the drug you can have the injection and I said um no I'll have a think about that and I refused the injection and my doctor was angry with me and I thought, no, I can remedy this. So I did. I went and did my own thing. I did my, my Arakira templates. I took vitamin K2 and D3 and I did something else. And I reversed osteoporosis back to osteopenia because you got curious and you because I got curious it. about well what am I not doing yeah I will do that and my nails seriously and I'm not they look amazing look at my nails they do not break mm. like they've been like that for the last nearly nine months Fantastic. since I remedied everything no, so that tells me if my nails are that good and they're all the same length, yeah. then that means my bones are good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 100%. So I, I was looking at like a year ago, my nails were all peeling and they, they wouldn't grow. Mm. So that told me my bones weren't good. Yeah. So I did something. So see, your body talks to you. Your body tells you yeah. what's going on. And so what a lot of people do is they ignore it and I, I put my hand up and say in the past I did ignore yeah because I didn't want to deal and that's when I was sick in my 30s and 40s I had six surgeries in my 30s and 40s and I just said I'm not doing that anymore and so I do something different I use the curious mind and I find a way of creating a template I show my holographic body what I want it to do and I practice that and I do it every single day mm. and I get the results. Um, I found myself in a really stressful position in 2011. I decided I didn't want to be a medical intuitive. I wanted to be a copywriter. Oh, my God. That's uh, in no That's way, shape or form similar. <laughs> random, radical, <laughs> shifting career, right? And I was writing copy for a naturopath. So it was still in my area of what I was curious about. But he was really, he said, I don't know what I want. I'll know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. So you use your intuition and you go and write it. I wrote it four times before he was satisfied. Mm -hmm. 
but it did me like the stress yeah. did me I couldn't and do that <laughs> it nuts crazy right and so I grew more cancer over here I grew another nodule of thyroid cancer and I was not well I was really not well and what I knew was that stress triggers tumors in me I know that so my responsibility is to manage my stress mm -hmm. and so I went and visited a friend who gave me this amazing book called The Hidden Science of Lost Civilizations. It was a heavy book full of science. And in there, I read about the quantum physics that the scientists are doing around the world. And I went, oh, okay, I can make that into a template. I can do the metaphysics of that mm. on my body. And I did, and I did it every night for nine months. And when I went back to the cancer clinic, they said, we don't know what you've done in the last year, but you've reduced that nodule by 50% oh. and your bloods are the best in 13 years. Yes. <laughs> so that was really good. And so we're up to now 2013. They said, just keep, they didn't ask me what I'd done. They just yeah. kept doing it. And then I went back the next year, had another ultrasound, more bloods, and they said, your bloods are even better and you've reduced it by another 40%. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. So I went back in 2015 and they said it's gone and we're discharging you from the cancer clinic. Oh, yes. So I did all of that by my own mm. method. And you did mention just before, I love listening to this. This is so good. I hope that lots of people are listening to this and getting curious. You mentioned a beautiful word, word called Arakira. Can you please tell us about that? Because you haven't really delved into it. And that's kind of, you know, you. So Arakira is the name that I've been given for the body of work that I've brought through. Mm -hmm. And that is an amazing story in and of itself. Um, Back in, oh, gosh, maybe 2006, I don't know, somewhere in that decade, I was getting really, really bad headaches, like 10-day headaches that were taking me out of action. And they were coming in waves. And I had a walking buddy. This is when I was doing the six hours of walking and four hours of clinical yeah. Pilates. And I had a walking buddy and she said, do you want me to send you some healing? I said, oh, my God, that would be amazing. So we queued it for midday. So daylight, broad daylight. I'm lying on my bed. She's in her suburb. I'm in my suburb. And I could feel something happening. And then after 20 minutes, something made me open my eyes. Seriously, mm -hmm. there was no ceiling in the room. I was seeing into the universe, into the void, and gold symbols were coming through that black void into my head. There were at least 20 of them. I wrote them down, but I've lost that, so I don't know where that is. And when the last symbol landed, that headache that I'd had for 10 days disappeared like that. Mm. And I sat up and I went, what was that? And I heard this voice go, that's Akira. And I said, what's Akira mean? And the voice said, the alignment of the physical, emotional, mental and spiritual bodies. And I said, surely that's not enough. And the voice went, it was like, all right, then, Arakira. And I said, what's that? And the voice said, the revolutionary alignment of the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, auric, energy, and etheric bodies. Seven oh, bodies. wow. And I went, whoa, how do I spell it? Oh, A-R-I-K-I-R-A. -I -I -I. So I went and got on Google and Googled it. And there was a Native, Native American Plains people called Arakira and I said you can't call this after the name of a tribe of people and they were a breakaway of the Pawnee 
And it was like the walls of the house did this big sigh. I could feel the walls expanding. And then the voice said, well, change your I to double E. So I got back on Google and typed A-R-E-K-E-R-A and it was zero, just exactly what I wanted. So I trademarked it. And I said, so my body of work is called Arakira. And they said, yes. And I said, well, now what do I do? And so I then started documenting what I'd um, been doing for the last, I don't know, 20 years. Yeah. And every time I worked with someone, I started, like I started out just doing the scans. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, well, what do I do with that? And I'd say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And so then I'd lie in bed and I'd say, God, if you want me to do this, you've got to show me how. Yeah. So then I started putting my hands on them. And then they'd start saying, what are you doing? And I'd say, can you feel that? Because I was just still like this. And they'd say, it feels like your hands are inside moving things around. And I said, well, I'm seeing a movie of that yeah. in my mind, but I'm not doing anything. So somehow I would figured out how to access the holographic body, work in it, but they could feel it in the physical body. Yeah, wow. So I don't know how that ha happened, but then what started happening is I'd get a run of people with all the same symptoms. And so that was like my apprenticeship with myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'd repeat something with the next lot of symptoms and they get the same result and the same result and the same result. And I went, wow, so that's a template that I can teach yeah. because you imagine this and that happens in the body. And so then I started documenting all of it. And then in 2014, I decided that it was time to make it a registered healing modality. And I applied to the IICT, the International Institute mm -hmm. of Complementary Therapists, to see if I could make Arakira a registered modality. And my sister had been working for an RTA, so she knew what you had to do to create a, a program that would be accepted. And I applied, I applied on like Wednesday night or Thursday morning. And they said it would take a couple of weeks. I got an email on the Friday to say that it was accepted, registered, and that I had now insurance for my modality. And it was the fastest modality I think that they registered. What a great celebration. I know it was enormous. And then I thought, okay, well, I've got that, I've got that. So now I have to write a book, right? <laughs> um, and that was really like I've had all these amazing experiences. I was working for that um, training company for online learning, and I had this dream about being in um it's actually in the back of my book uh this meditation where i went into a meeting room and anthony robbins was in that meeting room and he smashed his hand on the the desk and he said you have to contact me and i went oh okay but someone else came into the room as well and I didn't recognise that person and he's sitting in there and I thought, don't know who you are. So I wrote to Anthony Robbins' website mm -hmm. and said, look, you don't know me, I don't know you, but you appeared in my vision and told me to contact you, so I'm doing it. And this is where the curiosity comes in. If you get instructed to do something, do it yeah it doesn't mean that they're going to write back but it's a sign from the universe that you're trusting the messages yeah. that you receive so I did that two weeks later I'm at an event on the Gold Coast and my my boss was kind of pushing me to do this right and I was scared like it's a scary thing but after that event, 
Andrew came and stood in front of me and I said, I'm ready. He said, what? I said, I'm ready to do it. And he went, just, just stay there. And he went and spoke to his wife and invited us into their um, high-end coaching program the next day. And when I walked to go in, this guy was standing there and it was the guy from oh, my The med- other fellow. The other fellow. And that is who Andrew wanted me to meet. And he had sat us next to each other. Oh, wow. and, and so he became my mentor. And that's how I wrote my book. And so um, you gotta, you've got to follow the threads. Mm. And I follow the threads. And so I wrote my book. And then another mentor said, oh, no, you can't publish that. That's your IP and that's worth a lot of money. You can't sell that for $35. So I shelved it. And then I went on a retreat. Like one of my friends in another mastermind that I was in, like I invest heavily in in mentors, and she was running a retreat at Uluru in 2015. And this voice in my head's going, you need to go on that retreat. Mm. And I had no idea why. So I rang my friend and I said, want to come on a retreat with me? She said, yes. So we were the last two people to book and fill the spots. And while I was there, I had all of these experiences that I won't share here because that's a whole other podcast. But the long and the short of it was that the tour guide shared a um, story about the waterhole at Mutajulu and there's a cave there and she said, I see some, because I'm standing looking at this rock art and this voice in my head's going, ask about the key. Five times, ask about the key. I'm turning around it, (laughs) trying to find the voice and, and I'm looking to see if anyone else is being told something. And the tour guide looked at me and said, I see some of you have found the key. And my eyes went really big. And she said, we don't usually tell this story, Mm. but I will. And it was three circles. She said, the key is like a legend and it's information for the next people who come. So it was three circles, three lines, three circles, three lines and three circles. And I could see it then on the rock art. She said, those three circles down the bottom, that means that anyone can tell the story. We don't have to be Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. So the next three circles, only the rangers can tell those stories and they must be Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. And then the next three circles, that's if you are privileged enough to sit with an elder and if you hear those stories, you don't share them with anyone Mm -hmm. because you dissipate the, the energy. That was why I was there because there was some stories in my book that needed to be taken out and there was some stories that I hadn't put in that needed to be put in. So I could finish the book and then I published it. Mm. And so... Another celebration. Another celebration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Arakira is... It's not just a bunch of templates Arakira is a um it's a way of life it's a a high frequency life it's um it's taking personal responsibility it's doing the inner work and um growing because you have curiosity you want to be the best human that you can and because I had no teacher I had to figure all this out and so now I guess I'm a, an elder and I'm sharing that way of living because I'm happy every day. Mm. And, you know, what more is there really to be happy every day and love the life that you're living? And so Tash and I say we live an ordinary life in an extraordinary way. I love that. Yeah, and and that's that's it really in, in a sense. I love the ability to be able to support yourself, you know, to be able to be 
in in a way, um, you know, a healer in your own home, getting curious with your own body, getting curious yeah. with your own space and just exploring that, you know, yeah. that's so powerful. Yeah. And I, I've probably had an extraordinary life because of my inner inner life the inner journey is just as extraordinary as my outer journey and the thing that I love about the inner journey or the holographic journey is there's no rules Mm. yeah and when there's no rules you can do whatever you want and if you build the neural pathway in your brain that you can achieve anything where there's a will there's a way and so um I have been in positions in my career in the conventional world, working in law and accounts for, and there being a problem in the, the, the software or a problem in something. And I will go and go and go until I crack that and I create a solution. And I've just had a vision drop in. In 1982, the Commonwealth Games were on. Mm. I was privileged to be given a job in account, uh, ticketing and accommodation because I had learned how to use the Remington NBI word processor. We had eight-inch discs, so like this big, and you'd push them in, but you weren't allowed to bend it because then the data would all get yeah. corrupted. So... My boss came to me and said, Julie, do you think that that word processor would be able to handle processing all the accommodation for the Commonwealth Games in 1982? I said, I don't know. Let me have a think about it. And that night I dreamt the solution. Mm. And I went to work the next day. I didn't look at anybody. I walked in. I said, do not talk to me. I have a solution. And I spent all day coding the word processor so that we could put data in and it would process all the accommodation. Can you imagine? And then I pressed go and it didn't work. And I went, damn, it worked in my dream. So I went home and there was a piece of code that I had missed and because I dreamt about it that night, went to work the next day, put that code in, and it worked. And we processed the accommodation for the Commonwealth Games on the Remington MDI <laughs> word processor. I'm and then you received in a dream. I know, in a dream. And then the ticketing manager came a few months later and he said, you know how you did that thing for Mike? I said, yeah. He said the computer company who was processing the tickets they don't want to do it anymore and we're three months out from the Commonwealth Games. Can you do that for <laughs> selling the tickets? And I said, sure. <laughs> and so I already knew how it all worked. So that was an easy job for me. And then I trained the two girls in ticketing and they processed all the tickets for the 1982 oh, Commonwealth wow. Games. And, um, and I thought, oh, my God, I was 22. And I did that. Mm. And Mm. um, just trusting what you'd received and going with it. And you know what, Katie, that was before I even knew that I had the the gift, if you Mm. want to put it in quotes, Mm. because I was 22 then. It wasn't until I was 25 that I found out about that reading. Mm. So I guess I've always had that curiosity and I won't give up. Yeah. And I think people give up too soon. Yes. And when it gets, this is, this is really important, um, when it gets the worst, the darkest and the most powerful frustration, I celebrate that now because I know the breakthrough is just on the other side of that. But what happens is people throw in the towel at that point mm. and they don't get the benefit of, all of that work that they've done to here, they're literally right on the other side of mm. the breakthrough. And so I remember another coding. Um, I, I recoded a software 
for a software company called FilePro, all of the conveyancing um, precedents for law firms, but I had to crack, I had to figure out how to do the coding. And I had tried and tried. I, the coding was like this long oh. for one thing to pop into the yeah, document. Yeah. And I was sitting there, we were just about to go overseas and I promised that I would have the job finished before we went. And I was sitting there and I couldn't crack it like there was something not right. So I put my hand in my head, head in my hands, and I said, I'm just going to have to ring you tomorrow and tell her I can't do it. And I just thought I was going to crack it. And then I looked up and, you know, like the matrix, the the yeah. screen was I was seeing the screen like that and I went there's something wrong right there I had one symbol out of alignment I pulled that out and everything worked that's crazy it cool <laughs> one it was a bracket yeah. it was the in the wrong place but with it all going like that and it was an orange screen and I'm thinking oh, my God, I've done it. So I wrote to her and I said, I've done it, I've cracked it, I know exactly how to do it all. And she said, thanks, Julie, we don't need to anymore. Oh, no. And you know what? That was that was fine because for me the challenge is cracking the code. Yeah, yeah. And so in talking about that, I've then gone on and so now we crack the code in people's mm. psyche of what's stopping them from doing what they really what's in their heart and so I build the neural pathways for code cracking working on computer software mm. that I was self-taught and now I do that with humans Body. and crack the code of their resistance and their procrastination and a question that's really strongly yeah. coming to me is when someone's told something by a medical professional like yeah. you are not you've got two months to live blah 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 like or or you've got this autoimmune condition that is you know you're going to be a cripple for the rest of your life at the age yeah. of blah 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 how then do they shift past that um and get curious like what's the advice you'd give curious. to someone yeah they have to get curious they have to um trust in themselves more than they trust in the medical world yeah in their own body because miracles yeah. happen all the time katie miracles happen every single day yes and um one of my friends introduced me to a famous doctor in india a couple of years ago and he is a throat oncologist and surgeon. And um, I didn't know that when I met him. And so that's where I had all my issues. So he said to me that he's on a mission to find out about radical recovery because he said, we as doctors, we say to our patients, you've got three months to live or you've got two months to live or, you know, this is, this is it, that's it. But he said there's a percentage of people that actually recover. And he said, I'm curious about what it is that they do that's different to what the rest of the people do. And, you know, Anita Mojani, who wrote Dying to Be Me, she had fourth stage cancer. She was in hospital and she died. Mm -hmm. And then she came back and all her tumours disappeared in the next week or two. Like, it was wild. I think I've actually she, got that book here. I'm going to read that. Phenomenal book. Phenomenal mm, book. She someone gifted it to me. <laughs> yeah, amazing book. So this doctor in India wants to know those stories. And he said to me, Julie, a patient said to me, Doc, you do the 10%, you, you take care of that. He said, you leave the other 90% to me. He said, I'll take care of the rest. Oh, wow. I just got gooseies. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens, I think, Katie, is that 
we're conditioned, especially in the Western world, to believe what the doctor tells us, A, and then we're not taking responsibility for the other 90%. Mm. And the doctor can't control our thoughts. Mm. The doctor can't control our emotions. The doctor can't control what we put in our mouth. Mm. The doctor can't control our environment. See, we, we're responsible for that. Mm. And so when I had my thyroid out, I thought, oh, good, it's been cut out and it's gone. And I said to God, source, whatever you want to say, what do I have to do to get better? Because up until that time, I wanted to die. Mm. You know, I was so unwell in my 30s. I didn't want to live. Yeah. And so when I got diagnosed with cancer, I said, oh, my God, I've changed my mind. I want to live. What do I have to do? Yeah. So the voice said, meditate for an hour in the morning and an hour at night. So I did. I didn't miss a day. Mm. And people were saying, you've got cancer. How can you be so happy? I said, no, I don't have cancer. It was cut out and it was removed. And the only time I unraveled was when I went to the cancer clinic and the doctor put his hand on my knee and he leant forward and he said, oh, my dear, how's your family coping? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my dear, you do have cancer. I said, no, I don't. I said, it got cut out and it's gone. He said, oh, no, no, it doesn't work like that. And I unraveled, completely unraveled. And he said, no, you need to have radioactive iodine. You're not better. You're not cured. And I went, huh, okay. He said, no, you, you're irresponsible if you don't do that treatment yeah. because you have children and they need, they deserve to see their parent raise them and I went right so I was upset my heart's hurting right now I was upset and so I agreed that I would do that treatment and I nearly I just said it made me so ill I said I'm done I can't do this just let me die so that's the point that I got to And this is a really interesting thing, Katie, because once I made that decision, uh, I started to get better. I started improving, improved. And I think that I was pushed to the point where I surrendered this life and I was able to then build my new life. So this is my new life that I'm living now. And... I just didn't go back there. I just believed that I didn't have cancer. And um, I kept meditating. And I've just, um, like, I meditate differently now. I meditate by taking photos of flowers and capturing the essence of source in those mm. flowers. But and what they I'm, are beautiful. <laughs> thank you, my love. What I've noticed is that flowers feel your energy, yeah? And so there can be a completely still day, but you walk up to a flower and when I take a photo, I get about that far away from the flower, the flower moves. So what I had to learn is to still my energy so the flower would stop moving Mm. so I could take a clear photo. Mm. And so I built that neural pathway of stillness. And so when people look at the photos that I take, they're actually feeling the stillness. Mm. Yeah, because you you can embed frequency into images. And so, you know, I take a bunch of photos. Not everyone makes it. So Mm -hmm. I go through, I scan through, and I wait for one to speak to me to post. And it's because I've captured the energy of the the plant, the energy of the air around it. Mm. And there's a light about it that that's my joy. Like, and if I'm frustrated, if something's not going right for me, Mm. 
I just up and leave and go and wander around the garden and take flower photos. And then that centers and grounds me again. And then I come back and everything's back in flow. I love that for you. What a beautiful tool. My best friend lives in Canada and she does the same thing. She goes out in nature and takes pictures and, and the pictures she posts are powerful. Yeah. I'd love to see them, share Mm. them with me. Mm. Yeah. So that's me following the thread. That's me following that curiosity of taking those photos Um, and the reason I started was because they the the experts said that you had to post on social media every day (laughs) and I'm thinking well I'm not posting my photo so I'll post flowers Mm. and that's how it started I love that that's your meditation too because that's really important for the listeners to know that you know, meditation isn't like sitting in lotus on a pillow with you, you know, meditation comes in so many amazing forms. It's, you know, what works for you and what's best for you. Yeah, that's right. And it doesn't have to be an hour. Mm. Like it, it, it can be five minutes. If you can still everything within you for five minutes, then your body resets and you've, you've got your engine back Mm. on and I've got a meditation I don't know if you've ever felt like well just leave me alone and you want to curl up in the bed put the covers over your head and just go world leave me alone Mm. when I get like that which is very rare these days I've got a a chakra meditation and I know you are into Mm. chakras And I go and I do, I check in on all my chakras. I can be throwing the cover back off in three minutes and going, whoa, world, here I am. Yes. So fetal position to there in three minutes. Mm. It doesn't have to be an hour or half an hour. You can can transform your energy, Mm. your physicality, it can be a song and a dance, like, you know, 100%. a bit of shaking the body, getting out in the sunshine. Yeah, that's it. I can feel really sad and then I'll hear I'm on my way from misery to happiness. <laughs> and that's the proclaimers. I love those yeah. guys. That'll take me from here to there in three or four minutes. Yeah. Find what that is for you, listeners. Exactly. So get curious and find out what that is for you. There's so many tools out there. Mm-hmm. Tap into the this podcast and all the amazing listeners. Tap into the wisdom that Julie has given you today. And also join our Facebook group because I'm always throwing tools that you can use in there. So if you were to give the listeners any advice, Julie, if they were wanting to find out more about your work, what would that be? Look, you can go to YouTube. Uh, I've got a, about 70 videos on YouTube. Um, look for Julie Lewin on YouTube. Um, I've got julielewin.com. We've got juliantash.com. We've got lightcodelab.com. I've got a whole bunch of websites depending on what you're looking for. Like I've got, we've got books and cards and um, meditations. I'm on Insight Timer. I think my meditations have been listened to over a million times on Insight Timer. So there's seven amazing meditations on there. If you're not on Insight Timer, I've got them all listed on my website, julielewin.com. You can just Google me. It'll pop up. We've got a Facebook group called Magic Not Logic. Search for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If if what I've said resonates, there's lots of ways that you can uh, connect. Thank you so much. And I think you know, there's been so much goodness in this chat. But getting curious is the best advice. You know, you've given yeah, us is. all day. It is. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for having me, Katie. No worries. Bye. Bye.